Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Today I Found Out, and in the video today we're answering a viewer question because Kyle S. asks, do people really fish with dynamite like they show in the movies? Fishing with dynamite, or blast fishing as it's more accurately known, despite sounding like something more suited to a Looney Tunes cartoon, is a genuine and well-documented practice that is still commonplace in select areas of the globe today. This is more than a little unfortunate for the many fish and marine animals that call the oceans and lakes their home, due to the invariably cataclysmic impact the practice has on local aquatic ecosystems. Exactly when blast fishing first began is hard to pinpoint, but it should come as no surprise that it seems to have become popular within decades of dynamite being invented in 1867. Incidentally, dynamite was actually invented by Alfred Nobel, known today for the Nobel Peace Prizes, but in his time known as the Merchant of Death. While some probably fished using improvised or homemade explosives prior to the invention of dynamite, the creation of a commercially available, relatively safe to handle, and inexpensive explosive made it an option for a wider public. As to the first documented references of this method of fishing, while it is certain there were many earlier instances, the first we could find was an 1894 reference to a man being arrested for the crime of blast fishing. This was reported in the New York Democratic Herald, stating, John Tickworth was arrested at Binniewater for destroying fish in one of the Binniewater lakes with dynamite. He had just exploded a number of cartridges, killing several hundred fish, and was gathering them into his boat when arrested. The prisoner will be taken before the state game protectors of Albany. Five years is the penalty for the crime. Another early reference to blast fishing likewise comes from it being banned, this time in Hong Kong. In 1898, the government asked that the fishermen stop blast fishing and that they police themselves over the matter. The governor also issued the following statement to the fishermen. The practice of fishing by means of dynamite is unnecessarily destructive and contrary to the spirit of true sport. As you might imagine, little attention was paid to this request, so the government stepped up their game on the issue, officially outlawing blast fishing in Hong Kong in 1903. Despite the governments of the world seemingly realizing blast fishing was a pretty bad idea right from the start, this method of fishing's popularity quite literally exploded throughout the world thanks to World War I and World War II. Soldiers from both sides of the conflict made extensive use of explosives in fishing when stationed in foreign countries, a practice locals took notice of and copied. As an example of this, Japanese soldiers stationed in the Pacific during World War II are noted to have given out hand grenades to locals to be used for fishing. In return, the locals were required to share the fish that they'd catch with the soldiers. As a result of this, many Pacific Islanders became incredibly adept in the handling of various explosive devices. This is knowledge they put to use after the war, taking advantage of the numerous explosives left behind to construct their own makeshift fishing bombs. For instance, on the small island nation of Palau, even as late as the 1960s, huts could be found containing large caches of undetonated World War II explosives, with the compounds within the devices, or the devices themselves, slated to be later to used for fishing. As the availability of unused munitions from World War II dwindled, the islanders began to use more commercially available explosives, or, more often for small-time fishermen, simply constructed their own using readily available materials. For instance, one former blast fisherman, Abdul Karim Lang, noted that all one needs is a bit of fertilizer, gasoline, matchsticks, and a beer bottle to make a very effective explosive for fishing. But, as you might imagine, such homemade bombs can be very dangerous, and fishing in this way tends to make the practice not only devastating stating for marine life, but occasionally for the humans doing the fishing as well. For instance, Moana Sleiman, a former blast fisherman in Tanzania, who has since become a staunch opponent of the practice, accidentally blew off both of his hands when a homemade explosive detonated when he was trying to light the fuse. As for why he used to fish this way, he noted, My motivation was just the money I got from selling the fish, but I didn't know about the impact it would have on me or the underwater environment. Speaking of Tanzania, blast fishing is outlawed there due to it not only negatively impacting tourism, but also because they've seen a drastic decline in fish stock as a result. As one Tanzanian fisherman lamented, Blast fishing destroys the fish habitats underwater where fish reproduce, and that has had a big impact, especially on us who use ring nets to fish. The number of fish has drastically reduced. We are not able to catch many fish like before. 
He also stated that reporting blast fishing did little good in the region because when the blast fishermen are arrested, they bribe and come back. And if they find out that you reported them, they mark you and threaten to hurl explosives on your boat. So sometimes we are scared to report them. Speaking of this, while blast fishing is technically outlawed by most countries of the world, it remains incredibly popular in places such as the Philippines, Indonesia, and coastal African nations. This is both due to the general apathy of local law enforcement and how much easier it is in the short term to get a big catch by blast fishing. The latter, of course, is the key reason why blast fishing is considered so difficult to stamp out. When a fisherman can acquire what would otherwise be his entire daily quota of fish using more traditional netting methods in a few minutes by hucking a few well-placed, extremely inexpensive explosive devices into the ocean, there's little incentive for many of them to do it the hard way. We can scoff at the short-sightedness of these individuals, but it's important to note that many are completely ignorant of the long-term damage that they're doing to the fisheries that they depend on. And even for those who know, they have families to feed, often with few resources to do it, and may not be overly concerned about what will happen years down the line if they continue the practice. Okay, so what's the actual problem with blast fishing? To begin with, as alluded to previously, there is the danger posed to the fishermen, who are often using homemade explosives. Also, there's the danger to potential swimmers and scuba divers, which is particularly a problem in touristy coastal areas. Another big problem is the efficiency of this method of fishing. Blast fishing works by bursting the air bladders and sometimes other organs of the fish in the immediate area. The result is that some of the fish float to the surface to be collected. However, it's estimated that approximately 10 times that amount go the other way and sink to the bottom as a result of the ruptured air bladders. Beyond this all being incredibly inefficient, it should also be noted that according to one fish trader in Tanzania's Dar es Salaam fish market, she tries to stay away from blast fishing caught fish because she claims the fish caught in this way rot very fast. By the time you get home, they are rotten. Some buyers and sellers don't know that, so they buy them. But those aren't the biggest problems with blast fishing. For that, we have to look at what blast fishing does to the ecosystem of a relatively large area around the explosion. Explosives are, by their very nature, somewhat imprecise in their targeting, making the act of fishing with them unsustainable, as they will invariably destroy countless other marine creatures besides the fish, as well as their underlying habitats like coral reefs. Most critical for the fishermen, this ultimately destroys the habitat for the fish themselves. This means that the fish that survive in the area now have fewer resources to live on, and in many cases their normal breeding grounds are destroyed, further reducing the fish population beyond what the initial blast does. Unsurprisingly from this, as with Tanzania, areas where blast fishing is prevalent tend to see a rapid decline in fish stock. Nevertheless, blast fishing remains a problem in some regions, even where authorities have made a concerted effort to crack down on it. That said, perhaps the cleverest way to stop blast fishermen we could find was implemented in the Philippines. Here, authorities dropped statuettes of the Virgin Mary underwater across the country's coastline and announced it to the public. This actually cut instances of blast fishing almost overnight, as many fishermen from the predominantly Catholic region didn't dare risk harming an image of one of the most revered figures of their faith. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, I've got a podcast. It's called Brain Food. It's content just like this, but in the podcast form, we go into a bit more depth and really get into all of the details on a particular subject. Check it out through the links in the description below, or just search your favorite podcast app for Brain Food. And if you like this YouTube channel, I think you will really love that podcast. But if you want to watch something else right now, check out a related video from the past over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.